Good evening, Mayor and Council. It is now seven o'clock and we are live. Okay, you about ready, everyone? All right, let's call the meeting to order. Um, first, order of business is a Pledge of Allegiance. So if you stand, the flags are behind you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. All right, let's do a roll call. Molly, are you here? Yes. Amber? Yes. Lee's here. Paloma? I am here. All right, Pam? Here. Dan? Here. Um, Jeff sent us an email, excused. is excused, right? He has, yes. he's out of town on business. Yes. And then I see the city administrator. Uh, do we have someone from the city attorney online? Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Nicholas Ford Willis with Keenan Bean, City Attorney. Very good. Uh, anyone else online for, for the city? I think that's everyone, right? Okay. So welcome, everyone. Um, you know, I thought of various things we could do on April 1st, obviously. And, and then uh, I got warned by my spouse that, that no matter what I said, especially if it's really funny, it would be the quote that would appear. And it's like, oh, no, okay. Um, so I'll avoid that. Um, but I'm thinking about things we could do. Uh, and so with that, I'll start our first uh, community segment. So uh, we have folks from the Hudson Highlands Fjord Trail here to give us an update. I don't know who wants to start. Um, is it MJ? Is it you, Amy? Let us know who you are. So Amy Casala, I'm the Executive Director of Hudson Highlands Fjord Trail. And then we have a little bit of a presentation for you. Okay. And yeah, do speak into the mic because that way we can um, broadcast to online. Okay. So we can move on. Okay. So just give a little background. There's always new faces. Um, so we'll do a quick background and then give you a current status of where we are with planning and um, development of each um, phase and component of this. So this started almost 20 years ago, about 17 years ago um, in Cold Spring and Phillipstown, looking at Breakneck Ridge area on 9D, seeing safety conditions like this with too much traffic plus train arrivals, no off road infrastructure for hikers trying to get to the um, Breakneck Trailhead. It grew as a coalition next to really think about this whole corridor and how the corridor can connect these different spaces and places. Um, you have different parks, state park lands and state park trails, but no way to connect in between all of them outside of a car. Um, so the coalition came together. You have all of the municipalities. We crossed two county lines, multiple state agency partners, um, as well as Metro North and DEP and a host of nonprofit partners kind of keeping that community roots to the project. Next, sorry. Um, it's evolved over time. So it went from really safety on the roadway focused and moving people to really thinking about how do we, you know, deal with visitation, manage visitation um, in between a master plan that was completed in 2015 and 2020. There were a lot of changes in terms of COVID and visitation getting too high, a focus on equity and accessibility that maybe was too light in the prior iteration. So those new goals have been shaped and um, into a new plan, and that is the one we've been working with right now. Lots of outreach informed the plan as well as our consultant team, and we're always out. I think we have a list of eight things we're doing this month alone, um, just to get out, see as many people, talk to as many people as possible, and that continues to allow opportunities to refine the plan. This is the current vision. It's a um, shared use path that's ADA um, compliant, connecting from Long Dock Park and Beacon to Dockside Park and Cold Spring, and that connects both sit municipalities to the Hudson Highland State Park Preserve in between. Um, but there crosses four ecological zones, and our landscape architect, Scape, has been working on how to express that in terms of interactions people can have with the landscape, as well as the materials palette. So that's from the south, the river's edge, where you're really in between the railroad tracks and the river, reconnecting people to the river in that space. The highlands, which is the breakneck connector zone, um, with the hiking opportunities and the rugged mountain terrain. Then you go into the forest and have that 
quiet experience, and then the marsh, which picks up at the Fishkill Creek Causeway and Dennings Point. The whole project, obviously close to the river, has been designed for sea level rise. So we're using the high projections, and everything would be built to be resilient for 2100 projections. Um, so this just shows you we have multiple <coughs> steps in the process. We've mo master plans. We're currently wrapping up our environmental review that's going to become a public review draft soon and advancing some design development. Um, but this is to show you that it's a little slow process. There's steps in the process and, next slide, opportunities for input in the design. So for master plan, obviously we had lots of input environmental review, we're heading into a public hearing, but um, the, in the design development process itself, we continue to, um, in those earlier phases particularly, have more ideas, show people early concept designs, and refine them based on the input we receive. Next. Yeah. So this is a big project, it's 7.5 miles, so we would be looking to implement it in three general phases. Um, starting in the middle, because that's where the critical safety issues are, and then heading south and north. And while that's two and three, in time, because two takes so long to build, we'd actually be doing three at the same time. So they do kind of align to be done by about 2031. So we are wrap starting construction on phase one um, at breakneck, and this, they'll share the components of that and what to expect to see down in that corridor. Um, so this is really aimed at improving those conditions at breakneck for people arriving on the train and um, the hikers who just are parking. But it also helps restore this area. It's a highly disturbed railroad industrial corridor, lots of invasives, poor soil health, poor drainage. So we'll be working on restoring that part of the landscape as it's transformed into this um, park and trail space. This is the site plan for the breakneck connector and bridge. This is the piece that's advancing to construction currently. Um, you may have noticed some clear clearing of trees. That's for utility relocation work that has begun. Um, but the whole will add two new train stations. Um, right now they're yellow staircases on the side of the train tracks. So those will become 40 foot platforms. Fencing has already gone in. We have a, the trail that goes through the hole, parking off street and formalized on street, um, some gathering areas, restrooms, and we've already reworked the trailhead. And then the bridge over the tracks, which will help provide access to DEP for their facility. So we'll just take a visual walk of what that would look like from the renderings when complete. We're heading from the north to the south. So this is coming from the train platform. Now you're at the northbound platform to the left there. You see it's all re-landscaped with need to vegetation, the ADA compliant path, parking, bike parking. And if you turn to the right, you would see this when you're deboarding the train, bathrooms in front of you in two little buildings. Those would be um, sort of shared bathroom spaces, composting toilets. And then if you turned again to the right, You'd be at this scramble bank where you can gather. If you're deboarded the train, sometimes 400 people are coming off. This gives them space to gather and not be in the middle of the road in terms of the trail. <laughs> um, and they can gather, put their backpacks on, or start walking. Further south, and then you're approaching Breakneck Ridge and the bridge. And once you pass the bridge, if you were to look back, you'll see that it's a repeating arch. Um, pre-weathered steel undercarriage with a glue lamb wood deck. So it should be very natural feeling and quiet. What work we have completed includes... So back up one? What? Can you back up to that yep. part? So the escalator is going in about here? <laughs> On the next slide. On the next slide, okay. <laughs> the April Fool's escalator. It was an April Fool's post today. <laughs> um, so the staircase has been put in an upper overlook. This is complete. Um, so not an escalator. It's just stone, and okay. it goes up to Oprah Overlook. So that's dealing with erosion issues on the trailhead from overuse. We formalized paths, closed others to keep people out of habitat areas, put in a steward station with solar charging facilities for emergency responders. So that's already been put in, and then um, also stabilized some erosion on the early part of the Breakneck Ascent Trail. 
So that's what that looks like today with the stone stairs, and that's the steward station with solar. Um, so construction underway. So you, our work is in the yellow. That's the utility relocation that's being done by Central Hudson. But um, you'll notice some trees, they'll get back in there to do some utility relocation. When they drop off, DOT is going to start making some improvements to the tunnel in the project area. Um, so those would be wrapped up by October and then breakneck connector being constructed by Fjord and the bridge being constructed by OPRHP would pick up in earnest in November. So that'll just mean some periodic, in the near term, periodic trail closures um, and maybe some lane shifts when they're working on the tunnel. Um, but really the more work and more trail closure begins in November. Also part of phase one um, is Duchess Manor. Everyone's always familiar with Duchess Manor. We purchased that a few years ago to be our staff offices and visitor center. So we're at 30% design with that and starting the process with the town of Fishkill um, so to have that space reworked. And ultimately, it has been added to over time. So you see the original historic structure in yellow and then different additions that happened as they expanded the catering business over time. So we'll actually be restoring it back to the original structure and the family has been great and provided us with lots of historic photos so we can really see what it looked like before the additions. Um, we're also working on, because that's a, actually not that large of a facility and we do need some just utility areas for our, our field crews, with bays of gravel, et cetera. We've had this conversation with the city to put a maintenance facility co-located where your transfer station is um, near the wastewater treatment facility. So I circled in red two spots we're evaluating for adding that maintenance facility. This is just being surveyed now. And then two site concepts are going to be developed. And what we'd like to do is bring those back to the city council for discussion and sharing about what that really looks like. Um, but right now, it's just an idea. We haven't even put any images on paper yet. But um, we will have something to share in June. Right. So that's Amy, may I add something in? Um, yes. This came to the city because park, state parks reached out and said, you know, the Fjord Trail needs a maintenance facility. Would you consider allowing them to use an acre or more of the settlement camp, which would have required taking down an acre of trees and putting in all new infrastructure? Um, so we weren't excited about that. And we said, well, what if, what if we put you on the actual end of the trail on underutilized property along the transfer station? So we thought that could be mutually beneficial in that they would clean up an area that's somewhat blighted and then that they could be located right on the trail which means they have to build the bridge to get the beacon um, so we're going to come back to you we're very at the very earliest stages of investigations but we hope by june or july to come back to you and, and for those observing the the slide on the page between the two red circles is the transfer station building right so just to give you a sense of where that is okay where you go to do your recycling and you'll see there's not a tree in there. So the alternate that Chris mentions would have required a lot of tree clearing. So this is a much more, you know, less impactful spite site, right, more sustainable. And the real benefit is, too is that we get to drive straight onto our trail. Um, Parking is part of our overall program. So again, too much traffic and congestion at the breakneck, we're gonna be limiting parking in that area ultimately, but this will is this lot would be located just north of breakneck that provides off street parking for the, the supply we're taking off the road essentially. And then Bannerman's Castle Overlook Trail. So as we head north towards Duchess Manor from the breakneck site, um, we're just doing half of that right now, but connecting up to where there's a little loop-de-loop -loop at the top of the map, um, it's just this natural rock over outcrop that looks up and right across from Bannerman's Island. So we would be putting in that trail, and that might help some of the neighbors there who have people often walking down their driveways wanting to find a view of the castle. Next. Um, and then that's part of a larger, the parking lot I showed earlier is part of a larger system of parking lots that we would have and then a shuttle that we would run between those parking lots. So it's go train station to train station and stop at the 
um, different parking areas in between. So if somebody can't park at Breakneck, they can go up to Duchess Manor, our headquarters, park there, and then take a shuttle or walk back to Breakneck Bridge. So that's all phase one, and that would all be opening in about 2026. And so construction will take a little over two years. Um, phase two, which is already in the planning, would be focusing south, We're looking at dealing with the visitation management and congestion issues in the village of Cold Spring. And then how do you have a safe walking route from between the village and Breakneck? Currently, people walk on the road. Um, it's a little, you know, white knuckle driving when you do that. Um, and then restoring as we can go along that way as well. Um, it's about two miles, this route. And this, again, is where you would be on the water side of the railroad tracks. So this is where you're restoring access to the river. We'll just get a few snippets of what that looks like. Um, so it's a mix of on-grade trail, where we have enough land for that, and some on structure. And there's two different structures the engineers have been playing with based on water depths and construction logistics. And this would be before you have a highway corridor, a rail corridor, and after you'd have a trail corridor. So just put multimodal corridor right there. Um, but you can see we're retaining as much existing vegetation, adding more um, vegetation as part of the planting plan, and providing safe walking. Um, in addition to walking, again, this is really trying to be as accessible as possible as a project. We have different rest stops um, that can be a place to sit, enjoy a view, um, maybe put your toes in the water in one or two of those spaces, but every quarter of a mile essentially is the spacing. So if you're walking and you need to stop before you head back, you'll have a space to sit down. Um, so this, this shows you what a on-grade trail would look like. So it'd be a gravel surface that's an ADA mix, but maybe some space to the side where you could go pop down um, and on this little spit of land, put your toes in the water. And sometimes you don't have as much land, so you're on a structure. Again, staying at a sea level rise as well. And so this is an example of being on the structure, but still maybe having a space built in where you could have some place to pull over, enjoy the view, take a rest. And then you reach Breakneck itself, which used to be 9D route, used to go around there. So there is actually this little roadbed. So here again, we can return to being on grade. And phase three, again, this is heading north, um, but that's connecting into the city's park and trail system, um, Dennings Point, and really opening up, I think, for a little more exploration, the um, Fishkill Creek Causeway. So to get there, you're going through the woods. This is just a typical image of what through the woods would look like. It's essentially looks like a carriage road. Um, when we approach the Fishkill Creek, you might have some spaces to enjoy wildlife viewing or fishing. And then you head across Fishkill Creek on a bridge, which would be a new bridge built by Fjord that goes, it's a pedestrian only. So it's not using Tyaronda Bridge, but it would be using, basically creating further towards the water, towards the river, a new bridge that would be pedestrian only. And then it connects straight through into the existing trails at Madame Breton and Long Dock, um, which also is part, and I put a little, can we go back one? The Beacon Hopewell Rail Trail Study, which the city's participating in, is sort of that last piece of that. Um, and so we're involved in that conversation of how do those two projects hold hands or become one in this particular location. And here I will turn it over to MJ Martin. Or... Sure. So the good news is we only have 30 more slides. <laughs> April Fools. Um, I'm just going to talk briefly about some outreach that we've done and some outreach that we plan on doing um, in Beacon and the surrounding community. Um, in the past 12 months, um, thanks to Dan and uh, former council member Justice McCray, we were able to have a ward meeting with the constituents in wards two and four, um, where we were able to share some information last May. 
Um, we also had some stakeholder meetings. We've met with Neil and his team at Bannerman um, to talk about that overlook. And we've also met with Beacon Sloop Club uh, members for a, a brief inter, um, information session. We were at the Pumpkin Festival, which was a lot of fun in October. And uh, we just recently had a public info session at Duchess Manor on March 11th, which um, several Beacon residents attended, which was really great to see the turnout. Um, we've got another of those on Wednesday, and we hope to have more Beacon residents there as well um, to learn more about the visitation management and visitation projections for the project. Um, and that's, that is actually taking place from 6 to 8 p.m. on Wednesday at, at Duchess Manor. And you can, I think we may be full, but if you're interested, you can uh, sign up for the waiting list and, and we, may, we may find space if you're really interested. Um, we are planning on a chat that is Beacon resident focused at Howland Library on May 25th at 11 a.m. Uh, we'll be there to answer questions. Um, and then we're also uh, looking into tabling at the Beacon Farmers Market. Um, that date I'll have soon, hopefully. Um, but you may recognize my colleague, Rebecca Ramirez, who has been up and down Main Street talking to business owners and residents about our, oppor our other opportunities to engage and um, listening to comments and thoughts and concerns. Um, of course, kind of the big culminating event is the GEIS public hearing, which we think is going to happen uh, June or July. Um, New York State Parks is scheduling that. So as soon as we have that information, we'll put it on our website. Next slide. And just wanted to go over a couple other ways that we can you can get involved if you're interested. Um, one is we have a monthly Sunday afternoon chat at Hubbard Lodge from 2 to 4 p.m. every month. So if you go on our website, there's always an opportunity to talk to us, ask questions, learn more about the project, the things that really are interesting to you um, or of concern to you. Um, we would also love folks to become volunteers. They can contact Rebecca about that if you're interested in lending a hand and being, being involved. We've got some invasive species remediation that we'll be doing starting this season. Uh, we'd love for you to sign up for our monthly newsletter and you can follow us on social media. Um, thank you very much for your attention and we're happy to answer questions. So, um, hey, I'll start you up. Thank you so much. And, you know, we're so appreciative of how much work you've done. We are anxious to see you move into Beacon and continue the work you're doing here. Um, so a couple of thoughts. Um, obviously, we're very interested in where you're going to cross the creek. Um, and we recognize that you can't get all the way to the bridge. Um, we're trying to help you get connected to the right parties to get as far as you can. Um, uh, and then the other one I think we have interest, because you mentioned the bridge, is um, how you're going to connect to the train station. Um, we're going to be expecting that to eventually morph into some sort of a multimodal, um, you know, stop on the river side, I think, over time. We don't control that, Metro North does, but that's what we understand might be coming over time as they do their development. So I just want to make sure you're aware and that you're going to work with us. Of course. Yeah. So right now the project stops just in Long Dock Park, but I think we are completely open to going under that bridge and seeing how that connects and making sure that whole space works and functions well together. Yep. Great. Other questions from Council or others? I was curious when the shuttle might start. Is that going to start in 2026 or whenever the phase one um, is finished? Yes. What are some of the volunteer opportunities like? What kind of volunteers are you looking for? We're looking for all sorts of volunteers. So we have clerical work for someone who might be interested in working in the office with us. We also have event work, obviously, you know, as we go, go you know, through to communities and have these events like the chats and the public info sessions. But also the thing that we're really gearing up for right now is gathering um, and mobilizing a group of folks who want to get out um, and work on invasive remediation. So we're going to be starting a project at the upper overlook section at Breakneck, trying to work on, it's really riddled with invasive species, and we'd love to get 
a, a, a foothold this season. That'll be a multi-year project, obviously, um, but we'd love to get a core group of folks who are interested in working with us in that way. Um, I think I asked you this question last time you were here, but could you say a little bit more about your partnership with the Lenape Center and any other indigenous perspectives you're including in the planning? Sure. And it's an early relationship, I'd say. We've brainstormed ideas, and this always feels like a slow-moving object. So my, uh, my answer probably hasn't changed a lot. We've explored um, having a circle that's dedicated space at our visitor center with a sculpture that would be commissioned from a Native artist, um, and then other interpretive elements and stories that we'll be able to tell as we get into interpretation, which will start <coughs> actually in the, starting this summer we'll start to work on the themes and content for our interpretation. Um, could you also speak a little bit more about um, your flood plan? Um, I know that this is part of explicitly a part of your design, um, but you know we're very aware that our Cold Spring and Beacon train stations flood a couple times a year. Um, so the sea level rise is very present here. Um, and if you could just add a little more detail about your how you're addressing that in the planning. Sure. So in the Beacon area, if I may, I mean, some of that structure um, when it's on the shoreline trail, because there's always a balance to be struck with allowing upland water to move. And obviously there's a lot of upland water by breakneck um, that wants to get to the river. And so you don't want to impede that flow, but other places, including, I think when you'll, what you'll see at the Beacon waterfront, because that is scheduled to be inundated, what we'd have to do is berm up a little bit to keep the trail out of that water. And then think about the planting plan that goes in there because as salinity hits the roots, did anyone just hear the story about Stumpy in DC, the tree being killed by the salinity? So the salinity comes in, that starts to compromise the health of the vegetation. So you'd have to be revegetating over time with, with species that are ready to be wet and to deal with a little salt. So it's, it's sort of a slow adaption, but then also um, lifting when we get to this part of the project. Thank you. All right, everybody good? Mm -hmm. um, we're excited. Um, and, and you don't have to put in the escalator or anything else, just get here soon and we're excited. So. You know, that's the headline that's on the paper. I, I know it's, <laughs> <laughs> yes, but it'll be about you, not me. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Yes, our pleasure. Thank you for being here. Okay. Uh, the next one is uh, um, me. So I'm going to do a state of the city. Uh, and let's see if we, there's a set of slides that come with it, and I assume they'll appear momentarily. So uh, let me start up. Last year, I delivered um, my first state of the city, reviewing our progress during um, my first three years as mayor. Tonight, I want to provide an update on some of the achievements of this past year and our goals for the coming one. To place this in historical context, Beacon has made a spectacular transformation in the 30 plus years since I first joined the city council in 1993. From a down and out factory town with a largely boarded up main street into a rejuvenated small city with a thriving main street, preserved history and natural beauty, the envy of the Hudson Valley. That transformation did not happen by miracle or accident, but rather through rethinking the city's direction, thoughtful zoning and other changes documented in our comprehensive plan and then decades of gradual change led by those who love and serve this city. Yet we face new challenges today. How do we complete updating our 100-year-old infrastructure? How do we thoughtfully manage growth and development? How do we continue to improve our quality of life? How do we do our part to ease a national housing shortage and support everyone in our community? How do we finance all this while not overburdening taxpayers? So how have we done? Beacon, I am proud to report to you that the state of our city continues to be excellent. Um, you know, the things I'm going to talk about are on that page on the screen. In the past year, we've maintained financial discipline, and I do always start there. 
uh, enjoying more than a million dollar increase in sales tax from our new agreement with the county and keeping our tax increase below the state mandated, mandated property tax cap. We did that while breaking ground on a new central fire station, making record infrastructure investments, improving our quality of life, continuing our climate leadership and providing high quality professionally run government. So let me give you some of the details and we'll start and go in that order. Okay. So first, um, you know, I wouldn't be me if I didn't start with some numbers on the table. So uh, in terms of financial position, uh, Beacon remains in the best position it's been in in decades. Throughout my 30 years of service to the city as a council member and now as mayor, I have always been the taxpayer's fiscal watchdog working to limit property tax increases while expanding services and investing in the city's infrastructure. Um, let me start with a big one that's on the right. Uh, and so that particular uh, graph shows our sales tax revenue from 2011 to um, 2024. And you can see in those first couple of years, it was around $5 million total and then dropped almost a million dollars. That was the first year of the our older tax deal. So we lost close to a million dollars. And then our growth rate, and you can see that, didn't grow that much. And that was the second problem with that deal. So we renegotiated. I had a ton of fun because I got to be a numbers geek. Um, and you can see the numbers. Uh, our first full year this year we, was $5.8 million compared to 4.6. Uh, and this year we're expecting it to probably exceed 6 million. All right, so it's a huge number. Um, that really was um, a watershed for us. So 2003 was that first year of the 10 year sales tax sharing agreement that I negotiated with the county. We gained more than a million, as you can see, in additional sales tax revenue last year. That's gonna grow to more than 2 million, really meaning close to um, you know, 7 million over time, right? And to put that, this into context, an extra million plus in sales tax revenue is equal to 10% of our property tax base. So think about it as a way of saving a 10% increase on your property taxes. And we can put that money to use without raising our property taxes further. So it's a huge component. It's actually the component that allowed me to go forward with the firehouse, because the piece I had to put in place was the financing. Um, so that's been a huge win for us. Other things, uh, it also allows us, well, it's not just that, but we have lower property tax rates, and that's the number that you're charged per $1,000 of assessed value on your property. That's the chart on the left on the bottom. And what you see there are two rates. The top one is the non, uh, um, the uh, non-homestead rate. The non-homestead rate is the one applied to commercial properties and apartments more than three units. And then the lower of those two is the homestead rate, meaning the rate applied to homeowners one, two, and three family. So we have two rates in Beacon. What you can see going from 2011 to 2024 is it's turned south as um, we've continued to appreciate in value. We're now down to our lowest um, homestead rate of $5.9 per thousand dollars of assessed valuation since 2010, right? And that number will continue to decline. And so what that means is even though your property tax, your property value might increase because we're dropping the rate, the actual tax that you're gonna pay is much more moderated. And that's how we can deliver to the community much more modest uh, property tax increases, right? So those lower rates, uh, that appears on our $35 million budget and it will continue to come down over time. And I can assure you that increasing your property values is not gonna translate into tax increases of anywhere near the number of your assessed value increase. Right, And each year as we come in with the assessments, I'll do some sort of video to kind of take you through what you should be expecting. All right, Not only are the rates coming back down, but we've managed to keep down the property tax increases. That's gonna be the bottom right chart. So in addition to keeping tax rates low, we are committed to minimizing any tax increases. The mayor's 2024 budget kept the overall increase in total property taxes to 2%. That's despite higher inflation uh, you know, in that two to 4% range and well below the state's allowable cap, right? And we're fully committed to continuing this policy uh, uh, as we kind of move forward, all right? 
So what I want to show you on that top, on that bottom right chart, is those are the latest four years, 2021, two, three, four. That first number is the total growth of the levy, the property tax levy, meaning how much extra do we ask of all property owners in total, right? So you can see 2.6%, 4.6172, pretty small numbers to begin with. CPI inflation is on the bottom, so you can do your own comparisons, but we stay below inflation, which takes work, right? Because we still see the same inflation everyone else does. Then of that increase, that first line, the second line is telling you how much of it is coming from new construction, All right? So remember, we have a lot of new construction coming through because we had years and years of our, um, our urban renewal land, which you know, tore down homes laying fallow because we weren't very popular and we didn't get a lot of construction. That new construction adds to our tax base on the order of one and a half to almost three or four percent, depending on how much new construction comes in. The way to look at that is those are new property taxpayers. And so a part of our growth is being paid for by the new folks, right? And that those new construction that occurs. And the difference is the part that existing properties have to pay. That's the third line. When you look at that line, 1.4%, 0 0.9, 0.0, and 0.5, I can't, we can't keep doing that every year, but we're trying to do that as often as we can to keep tax increases for existing properties low. And we do it a couple of different ways. We do it by the sales tax deal that we did, by increased fees for haulers on septage and other things where we can charge others. And then the new construction component. And so that new construction is helping us pay for all of the quality of life increases you're gonna see in the budget covering inflation more than we need to ask our taxpayers to do for us. And so I think that's an important part of making the budgets work. It's one of the areas I worry the most um, and try to make the, these things work. I spent a lot of time with the city administrator and our finance director on these items. Um, um, the last thing I'll say in this area is just that we have a very strong bond rating, right? We've maintained our um, AA2 Moody's bond rating, which is one of the best in the region. And that allows us to borrow money at lower interest rates. We're about to have to go to bond market for the firehouse because we have a double A2 rating. Um, we're able to borrow at a much lower rate than other places. The city of Poughkeepsie uh, just had a bond rating improvement, but they were close to junk uh, because they had problems with their um, fund balance. So that's the piece I wanted to get to first. And that sets the stage for all the things that we'd want to do. And as long as we keep you know, doing our homework well on the finance side, we can do a lot. And let me talk to you about some of that. So the second one I wanna talk about is public safety. Um, this city, and again, I have 30 years of perspective, is a safe community with great police and fire teams. Our biggest ongoing challenge is a national one, which is dwindling volunteers for our fire and our EMS services and a need to fund a shift to more career staffing. And remember, as we do career staffing instead of volunteers, we got to figure out how to fit that into the budget. Now, we did some of that already, but we're going to have to keep working on it gradually each year. And we'll, we will do it in a way that's gradual to make sure that we can figure out how to fund this. Um, in terms of fire staffing, in my first term, <clears throat> we fully funded going from three to four firefighters 24-7, right? So that has to cover four extra employees because to get the to get 24 seven, you need four, you need three, you need four. Okay. Um, we later promoted staff to have a Lieutenant on every shift. So we have a command structure on every one of those shifts. And in 2023, we said, thank you to retiring chief Gary Van Voorhis and welcomed our new chief, Tom Lucchese. Um, in terms of ambulance services, 2023 marked the first year where the city made a major budget commitment. It was $250,000 which we'd never had to pay before for local EMS service for a combination of a new contract um, with um, ambulance, that's their name, to provide ALS, which is advanced life support ambulance service, as well as funding BVAC, the Beacon Volunteer Ambulance Corps to make improvements. Um, that's probably gonna be an ongoing commitment. And again, one we have to figure out how to cover. Other places in public safety are police services supplemented with mental health domestic abuse and addiction services added in my first term, service well. 
My 2024 budget added another cost-effective civilian police dispatcher, which frees up officers to be out in the community. And then finally, and then you can see this in the picture, our biggest and most obvious news is the thing across the street that's going up and looks great, right? So if you pass by Route 90 and Main Street, it's last June we broke ground on our largest capital project ever, a $14.6 million rehabilitation and expansion of the Beacon Fire Station. As mayor, I insisted we reuse an existing firehouse. Other proposals in the past we had proposed building a new at a new site and a new structure. And I just kept saying, nope, it's going there and it's going to be less expensive. That substantially reduced the costs and enabled investment in state of the art fire, state of the art fire safety and building efficiency and avoided large tax increases. It is currently on schedule and on budget. I talked to the site manager today. It's looking like August. August? Yeah. Um, and truly a, a pleasure to watch, especially now as the all brick facade is being unveiled. Uh, expect community tours in the fall. Um, I just want to point out again for perspective, our total property tax levy, meaning all the dollars that we collect from all our properties in Beacon totals in the 12 to $13 million range. That's for a year. This project is 14 to $15 million. All right, so you got to figure out how you finance this. And then when you add the interest in, even at a low rate, you're talking $20 million ish. Okay, we've got it. All right, and we're going to do it in a way that puts gradual increases. Um, and we've been basically banking some of the money each year in our fund balance, and we'll pay down a big piece. We have sales tax revenue that we think will provide a piece of it. We've been waiting for other bonding to be finished so we have room in our um, uh, our budget to take that um, interest and in payments we were doing to other bonds and apply it to these. All right, so I can assure you we've got this figured out. Okay. Um, next, I want to go to other infrastructure. So um, I think many of you have heard Chris talk about this. We've got $40 million of infrastructure work, 15 being the firehouse, but I'll talk to you about some of the rest. The city has hundreds of millions of dollars in critical infrastructure. 50 plus miles of roads and sidewalks, separate underground systems for water, sewer, and stormwater, four dams, three wells, water and wastewater treatment plants, a highway garage with heavy equipment, municipal buildings. Plus we have parks, fire, and police, but I'm gonna discuss those elsewhere. Beacon's infrastructure is in the best shape it's been in, in a long time. Our budgets consistently prioritize long-term investment and the city administrator maximizes non-city funding sources to avoid undue tax, invest, uh, tax burden. And then some of those 40 million uh, projects are underway, and I'm going to talk about a couple of them. The biggest one, and you've heard Chris discuss this, is rebuilding Route 52. Um, the city began re redesign work on Teller and Fishkill Avenues more than 20 years ago. This administration secured almost 100% federal and state financing. That's how you do this without raising taxes finished the right-of-way and other preparatory work and is awaiting bids on the projects. The current phase, which we think will come in at $8.8 .8 million, will rebuild the road, the sidewalks and the curbs, plus some underground utility upgrades on Teller from Walcott, that's Washington's head, Washington's bust, to Main Street, and then on Fishkill Avenue from Maine up to Memorial Park, that's Blackburn. We know we can get that far. We hope the bids are coming in this week. On the ninth. Okay, so they'll be in in about a week. Um, so we hope to begin construction there in this year, and then we will continue to seek funding to extend further up Fishkill Avenue all the way to the city border. But we're going to figure out how to raise the funds first, or at least most of the funds. In terms of wastewater and water infrastructure, we continue our long-term investment in drinking water and wastewater systems. A lot of that is going into the wastewater treatment plan in the next several years. That includes settling tanks. That's the thing on the top right in the picture. Uh, those are settling tanks where the goo in the wastewater either goes down or is up and skimmed away. Um, a dewatering system, a pump station for wastewater treatment. The pump station is on the bottom left. That's at the foot of West Main. Uh, and then finishing updates to two dams and soon we'll begin rehabilitation of the Melzinga Dam. Melzinga Dam is the one in the center. Um, that one we're starting on this year, next year. 
Um, it depends on when DEC approves, approves it. Okay, so it's coming when we got that planning in the works. The bottom right, uh, and the thing in orange there is the person, person, and that's their vest, just to give you a sense of how big it is. Those are the pipes um, by the old Talix site on yeah, Fishkill. Yeah, Lane. Yeah. So. Um, so that's wastewater. We're also doing paving and sidewalks. We have we do it every year. We repaved 14 more streets in 2023. Wolcott 90. Um, oh, Alice Cross, uh, Eliza Green, Harbor Hill, Hillside, Maddox, Robin, South Davies, University, West Church, and Willow. We added new sidewalks on South Avenue Park and elsewhere, um, but that was our focus. And then we did the railings as well on the Creekside Boardwalk at Madame Brett Park, right? So you've got some of the street repavings on the left. Um, you've got um, one of the sidewalks. We were redoing a tree on Main Street. That's the boardwalk at Madame Brett Park at the bottom in the center. Um, top right is South Avenue, right? That's the sidewalk going in? Yes. Okay. And of course, we keep fixing the dummy light. Right, so again, we repaired the beloved dummy light uh, and we're trying out new striping. That's them trying to put in the new striping and hoping to steer vehicles clear of it. I'm not holding my breath. So, um, so let's go on. Um, let's talk about quality of life. So in 2023, we continued to mimic substantial advances in our quality of life initiatives. Funded in part from new construction, as I've mentioned, we continue to implement the city's comprehensive plan which is focusing on Main Street's long-term success, along with environmentally sustainable density in a few areas, and even a rethink of Route 52. On Main Street, um, the Mayor's Main Street Access Committee wrapped up its meetings. The city has been em implementing quick wins. We've got a number of places with much better signage. We put in a bunch of stop signs, pedestrian crossings. We've done some striping. We're, we're gonna be doing some striping this year on the side streets, okay? Uh, and then the bump outs in Main Street that slow traffic. We created numerous parking spots with simple changes in 2023. And we've also started spiffing up the light poles. I think we were halfway through that. In terms of walkability, um, my wife found this. Beacon received a Walker's Paradise rating of 96 out of 100 from Walk Score, which compared to an average score of 48 for New York State. We are working with the county's public transit system right now on increased options on the three bus routes in June 2024. We think we've got an agreement with them, but we're trying to work out the details. We've got a rail trail coming. We've successfully encouraged the county to consider expanding the rail trail system with Metro North former Beacon Line, which runs from our train station along Fishkill Creek, Main Street and Route 52, and then north to Hopewell. That connects into the Empire State Rail System all the way to Buffalo and the Canadian border. Dutchess County Planning has kicked off a feasibility study uh, at, our, at our request late this year, and so we're expecting that to work, uh, do their work this year, and we believe that's the start of an exciting decade-long project. Um, at the same time, I formed a new mayor's committee to look at how the former car dealership section of Route 52 might evolve and to suggest concepts such as improving the streetscape and walkability, connecting to future biking, hiking on adjacent rail trail, and building a connector road to the high school in the Camp Beacon area. In addition, in the past year, we've done park improvements, which we've been doing every single year. Uh, those are our most popular resources, and the improvements in 2023 focused on Memorial and Green Street Parks, including reopening of public restrooms and we install new basketball backboards and nets at South Avenue Park. In 2024, we're going to be rebuilding the We Play Hot Park at Memorial Park with a new play structure, new surface, new fencing, and site amenities. And then we'll also be renovating South Avenue Park, uh, where we'll be resurfacing the tennis and basketball courts and putting in a new restroom. In terms of recreation programming, since I became mayor, the recreation budget has doubled to more than a million dollars. Uh, the 2024 budget included a record 17% increase for recreation. Uh, that enabled the city to add a new full-time staff member and to expand after school, summer camp, and other programs. Remember, we're doing this and staying under the tax cap. Um, as you just heard from uh, Amy and MJ, the city strongly supports the Hudson Highlands Fjord Trail to connect Beacon and Cold Spring. We're collaborating on a future trail maintenance facility on unused property, as you heard, at our transfer station 
and we are also making progress on the mayor's concept of creating a greenway loop trail on the east side of Fishkill Creek. And you know, Mirabeau has broken ground on their construction, and that piece of the east side uh, puzzle is in their um, site plan of their project. Then also in terms of affordable housing, Beacon is a Hudson Valley leader in effective affordable housing with roughly 30% of our rental units already in affordable programs today. That is second only to the city of Poughkeepsie in our county. We are working with the county to redevelop the Main Street parking lot uh, of its motor vehicle building for affordable housing. That's the one on the corner of uh, South Elm and Main. And we recently submitted a letter of intent to New York State to become a pro-housing community. And in terms of climate leadership, um, you know, I want to start by saying I, I remain committed to making Beacon a model of sustainability for the Hudson Valley. We have been a silver certified climate smart community um, since 2020, 21, 20, all right? Just to give you a sense of what that means. So we were the second one in the state to get silver status. Silver status is the highest status. There isn't a gold. Um, that is it. There are four counties that have silver status, two villages, two towns, and two cities in all of New York State, right? The only other city is Kingston. Um, counties, I can't, we can't compete with them. But, you know, when a whole county does it, bless them. Um, the two villages are both in Westchester. The two towns are both in Westchester. And they're pretty more affluent than we are. Um, so I think we're doing okay. But for us to be truly climate smart, which is what our silver certified climate smart community says we are, we have to prioritize what matters most and find ways to achieve those goals over time without overburdening taxpayers, right? And that's gonna be the trick, right? We could all wanna do all of it all at once, but we kinda of have to prioritize it. Let me give you some of the pieces that we've got in place. First off, we, we're 100% renewable electric, right? We already had about 80% of our electric coming from our own uh, solar farm on our landfill. To the extent we have any additional needs, um, and that's shrinking over time as we build more solar on city property, we buy the rest by doing um, renewable energy credits. We are continuing to implement our green fleet policy that adds both all electric and hybrid vehicles to the city's fleet each year. We also continue to monitor emissions from city operations, and we're installing additional um, EV charging stations in public parking lots. Uh, the bottom right picture on this page is me getting a charge out of the latest EV lot. Um, as you heard, our central fire station will be amongst the most environmentally sustainable in the Hudson Valley. It's an all-electric station. It features geothermal heating and cooling. It uses um, a large number of wells dug in the adjacent parking lot, which is what we have to do to that parking lot before we resurface it. It has high efficiency installation, natural lighting, and an additional electric vehicle charging stations coming as that lot gets redone. In 2024, we also look forward to installing a solar panel array on the highway garage, which will give us an incremental generation of renewable electric. And then we're also launching a community solar program with Mid-Hudson Energy Transition. In terms of municipal compost posting, the city recently um, composted in 2023 upwards of 100,000 pounds that we diverted from our trash into our composting. And we are expecting that to grow further. And then once again, we welcome the Green Team Beacon, which is a program of the Cornell Cooperative Extension. That's them in the middle there. And supported them in planting pollinator flower gardens on city properties. And then finally, we planted even more trees in 2023 at Memorial and South Avenue Parks and on Main Street. This year, we also initiated a new program in addition to our own tree planting as a city, where we offered Beacon property owners the opportunity to purchase and plant trees at almost 50% off the retail price. Uh, it's been fairly successful, and I'll ask you how we did. You know, can you tell us now? Or? 37 trees we sold. And that's the public doing it, that's in addition public. to ours. Yeah, so we'll yep. be over 50 trees this year. Great. All right, thank you. Then finally, I want to talk about good government. Um, I think none of this gets done unless there is a professional kind of objective, doing the right thing, taking their time government. Um, Beacon's form of government has a part-time mayor um, who manages a full-time professional city administrator. 
I really, really believe in that form of government. It, it truly works. And the people who came up with this um, almost 40 years ago, when we read it, our charter, my hats are off to them. I believe residents, taxpayers, and employees deserve a professionally run city, one that uses taxpayers' funds effectively, that empowers department managers and develops our employees. We have an outstanding, all right, yeah, we have an outstanding city administrator. He wrote that, I didn't write that. Um, I wrote that, let's be really clear. And we use outside professional services for our city attorney, our city planner, and our city engineer. And that's because I want objective advice. And I want good, strong advice. Um, I believe in empowering managers and encouraging robust debates on priorities and how to get things done. And I believe we get much better results and more satisfied employees. I mean, just a couple of specifics and then I'll wrap up. Um, you know, in terms of transparency, we strive to make all city board and committee meetings open to the public, well publicized, viewable online, and by tape on local cable with opportunity for public comment. Don't worry, your public comment's coming right after me, right? We continue to successfully attract professional and well-trained employees. That includes a new city planner, a building, new building inspector, fire chief, and city clerk in the last year, and quality additions in multiple departments that broaden our diversity. Our full-time HR director has helped leverage the city administrator and the mayor, and has updated and standardized employee policies to effectively support our 130 plus full-time seasonal part-time workforce. And just some final words. Um, in closing, as I said at the start, the state of Beacon is excellent. I am truly proud of the work we've accomplished together in the past year and during my four plus years as mayor. More remains to be done, but let's take a moment to review our progress with some perspective and to appreciate what's been done. This past year, I helped organize a meeting and discussion with four current and former mayors, Beacon mayors, whose tenures cover um, the last 35 years of Beacon's history. So that was Clara Lou Gould, Steve Gold, Randy Casal, and myself. There's a photo of us on the prior page. Um, now that's truly a long view in terms of perspective. One of the things that clearly rang out from the conversation was just a simple formula for progress, regardless of politics, partisanship, and short-term travails which was have a shared vision of where we want to go, provide city services well, keep tax increases modest, and keep patiently heading toward that vision. You're not going to get it all done at once, but you can see where we've been and it's taken us 30 years, but it's a pretty amazing journey. I want to thank the city council, the employees of the city, including our department heads and our city administrator who make it all happen, as well as the residents who volunteer their time for the city and the community in so many ways. Um, you know, I love Beacon, and it has been my deep commitment of community service for more than three decades, and it is truly an honor to serve you as mayor. So thank you. All right, public comment. <laughs> um, this is the first opportunity for public comment. If you've signed up, I'll call your names one at a time. Neil, you are first, so don't worry, head on up. Uh, just remember, it's three minutes on any topic that you like. We don't have a public hearing today, so it can be any topic yeah. that you like. I think we do have a public oh, hearing. Have a public you have a public oh, yeah, hearing on 3-5 Henry. All right, so I didn't even read my piece of paper. Um, there is a public hearing on a Restore New York grant on 3-5 Henry Street. So if you have a comment on that, just wait for the public hearing. And then please go right ahead. It's all yours. Yeah. <clears throat> I wanna. I came here for support of the. I can never say it right. The for the Ord Trail. I think it's an incredible project. I think it's gonna um, link Beacon um, all the way down to Cold Spring. And it's gonna be amazing. Uh, if you look at the what they did with Walkway over the Hudson and what they did with the High Line in the city, this is gonna be what they're doing now and. The scenic Hudson and the people who were running Amy running the, 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 the trail are doing an incredible job. Um, it, it takes time to do something. Um, when I first came to Beacon was in 1993. We actually uh, were able to move here in 95. And one of the reasons we were here is to do Bannerman's Island. Um, as of this year, 
Bannerman's Island is 30 years old from when we incorporated the city, so we'll be celebrating uh, our 30th anniversary for Bannerman Island. Uh, so we're really proud of that. But when we came here, I saw the city council and the mayor at that time talking about how to revitalize uh, the city of Beacon. And we came to a meeting for, at the Holland Center for, for Bannermans, and uh, the, everybody was there, including Mayor Gould and a lot of people. And we could see what was going on across the street. There was two buildings being restored, and we knew, in early everything, an antique shop was there. We knew it was going to change. But we also came to meetings and saw people like uh, Mayor Kiriakou and Steve Gold and uh, Chris White and even Randy Casal and uh, Mayor Gould uh, talking about these things and, and the road to change. And some of that was changing the zoning without changing the zoning on Main Street so that the uh, storefronts that were apartments could change. Bannerman Castle Trust would not have an office on Main Street or a gallery there for Bannerman. So we're really thrilled about that. Uh, we don't know how long we can afford to stay there, but we're there and we're really thrilled to be there. And um, I, I want to thank all of you for that. I want to thank um, Amy and all the work that you guys are doing. And I know there's another project here. Uh, they're doing a wonderful art for Michael um, back here. And we're really for your project. We think it's going to be a great asset to the city. And um, the arts always make things incredible here. So thank you for doing what you're doing. And uh, thank you to all the people who are making Beacon an incredible place. Thank you so much. And thank you to Kelly Ellenwood, who's now our development officer for Bannerman Island. So we're thrilled to have her. And she's great. And so are all the people here. Thank you. Um, and so with that intro, the <laughs> next up is Kelly Ellenwood. I, I'm not going to say much because I think the dance of it all, but I just want to say. I just want to say thank you for all the hard work you have all done and um, great call on not denuding the settlement camp of trees. Wow. I know there's a different power shift between who owns the settlement camp and who owns the uh, our transfer station, but it's I think it's going to work out well. So well done. And oh, if we're going to have any extra money in the budget, I would like to propose that the Helen Center gets a nice little chunk of change to restore that portico, or at least go to their event on May 9th. All right, that's it for me. Thank you. So that, that's it for those that have signed up. If anyone else in the physical public would like to speak, this is your opportunity. Come on up, come on up tell us who you are. If you like, tell us where you live. Try to do my stopwatch just to. Clark Edmund, 2 Wilson Street. Um, so I'd, I'd like to um, address uh, whatever. Let's see if I can't turn it off. Um, I wanted to spend some time on the proposal on the water tank. Um, I found that the information um, was um, um, woefully inaccurate in terms of uh, the short form. I thought that there were some deficiencies that were actually incorrect to which I can lay claim to, prefer not to, but may be my only choice. But I'd like to go back to the, um, the presentation by the mayor. Um, I learned a long time ago that it is much harder to blame the system that creates the political problems in America, um, that, um, that it's the systems and not the people. Uh, the systems that allow for the errors that people make in the human spirit of life. Not if that makes sense. but. It really does come down to what we as the public permit to occur and in the absence of a media that is tenacious to pursue the idea 
of a better democracy. And, and so it, it's my woe and beacon is rooted in the collapse of introspective thought among the leadership as to what's really going on and, and, and how accurate the message are conveyed and to which extent they're challenged. And so I'll, I'll, I'll close to say that it's a good representation to note that of the mayor's slides, which I'm sure will be published eventually online, um, lack the growth of debt and lack the projection for how the debt is to be addressed as favorably as the mayor. 15 seconds. A second one quickly would be um, the tax uh, credits. And there's no doubt the gross number. He says it's, it's you know, going to grow to 7 million. Great. God bless uh, uh, the work. But your time is a lot. How was it negotiated? And that those data has never been revealed, nor has the audited statements for the last several years. Thank you so much. Um, anyone else? Please let us know who you are. Come on up. Wait, it's, it's yours, Teresa. Teresa Kraft, Ward 3. Grateful to the mayor and the team for tonight's positive State of the City address. Last week, I watched along with the workshop online and agreed with many points. I believe we're heading in the right direction with the parking with the new city planner and team. One of the things that was brought up was the transition zone. I really think the city should go back to having the historic overlay districts have more protection. I don't think it's too late to undo that. I agree with keeping the meetings public comments to a civil tone, making it mandatory that everybody follow the same rules, and if not, they get ejected from the game. I suggest that the City of Beacon consider replicating some of the success of the Catskill Mountain Railroad, a family-friendly tourist attraction that has recently been awarded grants totaling over four and a half million dollars. We know bringing back the Beacon Incline will never happen, but by converting the recently abandoned rail spur into a tourist light rail attraction, the city would not only reduce traffic congestion, but also improve walkability and provide a reliable mode of transportation for people across Beacon, connecting the future Fjords Trail and the larger Hudson Valley. Who wouldn't love to experience riding a tro trolley-type train again? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the physical audience want to make a comment? Okay, and remember there is a public hearing on one item, so you can also reserve comments for that. Does anyone online want to make a uh, public comment generally? Um, if you're on Zoom and you'd like to make a public comment, please use the raise hand option at the bottom of your screen. If you're joining by phone, please press star nine. If you'd like to join and you're tuning in by YouTube, you'll need to join the Zoom by visiting beaconny.gov. And right now we have no hands raised online. Okay. Um, so let's do um, public hearing. All right, so um, this is a public hearing on uh, three to three and five Henry Street. Uh, there's a Restore New York grant that they're looking for. Um, I will open up public hearing by first asking Nick to provide an intro uh, of what's up and then also of the two people that will speak after you. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. So hang, this is a, hang on one second. We just got a couple people coming in and out. So give them a minute. Understood. All right. The crowd was here for the Fiore Trail. They weren't here for the state of the city. Uh, I thought they were coming in. Uh, All right. There was one here for the state of the city. Maybe two. Um, I think you guys are fine. Go right ahead. We're, we're just adjusting volume because the Zoom is blowing us out. Okay. Okay. And Thanks, ben? Nick. Try it now. Please. Okay. How is that, Pete? Hey, uh, Chris, is that yeah. good? Uh, yeah. Keep going. <laughs> okay. So this is a public hearing yeah. for the city to consider whether it wishes to, to support the application in round eight of the Restore New York Communities Initiative for the Barrage Work Studios redevelopment project. 
So in the New York State has been offering this program for almost a decade. And so in February, the governor announced the eighth round of a $60 million grant program called Restore New York. It's administered by the Empire State Development Committee and, and the funds are distributed to the municipalities to fund um, projects that are rehabilitating um, certain areas or facilities that are being vacant and are consistently being redeveloped consistent with the community's redevelopment plan. And so the goal of Restore New York is to help attract residents and businesses by redeveloping residential, commercial, and mixed-use properties. And the purpose of tonight's hearing is not that the city is awarding funny money, but rather that this will be an application the city will support and assist in advancing to New York State. And then New York State will evaluate this among many other applications that are being submitted throughout the state, and then New York State um, makes a determination as to whether the funds will be awarded or not to this particular application. And so the purpose for tonight is to see if the public has any comments on this particular application that the city would be that um, stating that it agrees would be advanced for consideration by New York State in its sole discretion. So that's an overview of the hearing of the program. And Mayor, we had a long discussion of this in workshop, but we asked Michael Braden and Sophie Henderson to come and do a very brief presentation for people that weren't at the last meeting or tuned into the last meeting. Okay. So my, my one question is, can these um, boards turned this way be seen by others or the, not? These are in the um, packet as well. Um, that means I can see them without those boards. Yes. We weren't sure if they were um, ben, is it, is it possible to project the uh, photos that were sent to us that are in the packet? There you yeah, go. Yeah, there you go. All right. Now we can do it that way. And we can roll through those as, as you're doing your presentation. Okay. Go for it. I, um, my role uh, was to uh, talk to everybody a little bit about the Sophie, could program. you use the oh, mic? Sorry. Yeah, just talk to us. Um, you don't have to, because um, yeah, it's going to be easier way. just talk oh, yeah. this way. Uh, my role was to uh, uh, brief everybody on on the program, and uh, but the city attorney has already done that, so um, <laughs> we'll turn it over to the project. But if there are any questions from the public um, about the fine details of the program um, and why uh, we feel that this project um, aligns um, strongly with it, we'd be very happy to answer more. Thank you. Good evening, and uh, <clears throat> as the tradition says, uh, when uh, first of the month, rabbit, rabbit. Um, Mayor, I appreciate very much uh, your presentation on the state of the city of Beacon, because I think you outlined in your presentation essentially the project um, that we're um, presenting and, and going to um, hopefully build and move forward on. Um, just to quickly describe the project itself, it's an existing building on the corner of Chestnut and Henry Street. Um, it has a, a fun history. Um, three brothers from Italy um, settled in the area, um, the Ninnies, and they uh, created a development company and uh, built this project in beginning in 1940 during the war. And during that time, there was restrictions on building materials and processes of construction. Um, so they collected materials throughout the Hudson Valley, uh, used steel beams, brick, CMU, which was cinder block at the time, and um, constructed what was planned to be a two-story building, but just didn't have the supplies to do that. The building started out as um, uh, an iconic sort of Studebaker showroom, and became Dinopoly uh, Motors and um, Buick and Pontiac took over. So it, it had this sort of entrepreneurial creative background um, to begin with. And uh, the Studebaker is an iconic and very highly um, uh, viewed uh, design um, at the time and today as well. Um, the building today, it's gone through the long history, still mostly automotive uses and garage and storage. And during that period, um, went through a lot of uh, uh, fuel, oil, and, and 
all the, the sort of toxic waste that our vehicles create. Um, so uh, the building today is t technically um, not that habitable because it gives off a fairly high level of VOCs. It was, um, there was a, a spill um, that was cleaned up um, in the early 2000s, late, late 1990s, early 2000s, and the state signed off on that. But it's still gassing off uh, VOCs, which have to be remediated. The roof is filled with asbestos and has to be completely removed and um, mitigated. Um, and then just the structure of the building has um, been under uh, significant neglect and uh, needs a, a, just a lot of remediation to just bring it back to life. That being said, um, it's a unique site. It's a wonderful opportunity. It is in the transition zone. Um, which I just personally have a real affinity for. And it's, um, it's just kind of the history of the building. So um, I was looking for a place to have a, um, an art studio for myself, and this, the square footage of this was more than I needed. So the vision here was to, what can I do to give back to the community? And um, to start with that is by, by renovating um, this building, um, we'll be contributing back to the tax base, right? Um, which will help um, anchor the vision um, that the mayor and the city council have worked so hard to, to promote. And we're trying to hang on to the sort of qualities of the, the building, but actually update it and bring it into a sustainable um, environmental uh, stewardship, I guess is a great word. Um, educational opportunity for students and for the community and for the city as a whole to show what would happen if we put all our eggs into a basket from the roof will have a, a large um, 60 uh, I think it's 63 kilowatt um, PV system photovoltaic energy system um, that in turn will allow us to be an all electric building that is zero carbon and zero draw on the grid. Actually, we will be um, net, uh, net zero building. You can see on the image, you'll see all the solar panels. And as of a couple days ago, I've added um, solar thermal. So our hot water systems will be um, supplied by the sun and will then interact with what we are doing geothermal. So we have vertical wells that go down and will uh, actually be under the new guidelines, being able to go deeper. And, um, but the, the solar thermal will interact with the geothermal, reducing the energy load even further. Um, doing something that I haven't really seen in Beacon yet is that we're taking all the rainwater that lands on the roof, which has quite a few um, toxins in it, um, to put it simply, you know, heavy metals and different things that are accumulating the atmosphere from just the winds and blowing around. So we're going to take all that runoff water and run it into a biofiltration planter that will be all along Chestnut Street. And that biofiltration planter then becomes an educational opportunity because it'll be filled with wetland plants, both in terms of the flora of um, th those kind of environments but also a nice educational opportunity from a sustainability standpoint. Um, it, this building is a mixture of both passive and active uh, environmental and solar um, uh, um, sort of controls. On the Henry Street side, we have a, a large green wall, which will uh, buffer and filter the uh, facade um, and help mitigate the different you know, from summer to winter atmospheres um, with the vegetation coming off in the winter, allowing more radiant heat gain. We're both now upgraded to uh, both dual and triple plane glass, depending on the solar orientation. Um, we're putting in all new sidewalks. Um, and if you've noticed the sidewalks are in rough shape, then I've not asked for any assistance from the city on doing that. We are adding uh, five street trees um, to the project uh, at a large caliber, tip, not typical of uh, developments here, but something that you can actually go by and appreciate right away. 
Uh, there are planters on the front um, that'll be filled with um, really great plants. <laughs> um, but I guess the most important part is, um, and it's, it's in the transitional zone, which starts bringing those aspects of Main Street redevelopment into um, what is a residential community, but at a low impact scale. We're not going up with the building. Um, is the actual programming of the building. So it is programmed with three uh, rental studios, um, art studios for artists. Um, and my vision here was really looking at professional artists who already live in the community, but just don't have the space and facilities to work. That will help support the programming of community outreach, which will, um, the focus has been on uh, disadvantaged uh, youth and people who just haven't had opportunities to um, show artwork or to have places to work. So the, the viewing room is a gallery space that will be open to show, show work, um, but it'll also be a place for to have poetry readings and uh, different uh, stage readings or small, you know, introductory music kinds of uh, opportunities on a periodic basis. My main painting studio, uh, which is where I would be working, will also have an opportunity to show larger scale events. We've already had the Beacon Bonfire um, in that space, um, and it was a really, I got to say, a really successful event, uh, watching what the folks in the Beacon Bonfire, what they put together, and having this raw space to just kind of work with, it was really pretty exciting. Uh, to see and the, the amount of talent here is just in Beacon is um, it's wonderful to be able to express that so that that will show anywhere from music to fashion show to puppets to whatever you know things are going on so um, and then there's uh, this this sort of street scene what it brings to the street but that's kind of an overview of what the project is about and appreciate the opportunity to kind of share that with the community and answer any questions at the moment. Um, so when I uh, open the... uh, if it's okay, we have any public comments, right? So yeah, this... so we, we noticed the public hearing and we could just go into that. All right. So you've heard a, a presentation. So this is the public hearing mm -hmm. component. If you and have, I think uh, Nick had a little bit. He, Nick, did you have anything you wanted to add? Uh, Chris, no, I think this summarizes for now. There is in the council's packet or uh, resolution that goes through the criteria and establishes that yeah, the application uh, satisfies that criteria. Okay. Yes, sir. Clark Gebman, 2 Wilson Street. So this is um, a classic example of what I was talking about earlier about the dearth of public information and analysis in terms of making critical decisions for the city. Here you have a parcel that's um, approximately 10,000 square feet purchased by an owner whose address is in One East Main and for the price of $825,000. Um, my quick uh, seat of the pants uh, survey would be that it could uh, logically provide for 30 uh, units of affordable housing um, at the cost of 825000 for the site demolition costs rounded up to a million divide by 30 and you come up to a per unit land cost of about 30000 or so per affordable housing unit which could under, go under an ownership program for a mortgage of probably somewhere around a quarter of a million under an affordability program be a rent to be significantly affordable. So the council is being asked to endorse one person's vision for a gracious community objective in favor over the designated zoning of residential housing in a primary premium location where height sun and development features of traffic and flow and appropriateness are primary and 
only substitutable by maybe the county site. And you're being asked to endorse this one person's vision, very glorious, very endorsable. Artist community is a very important attribute, but is it really more important than providing affordable housing? In doing so, your endorsement tonight says, no, this is more important. And so you shed 30 potential apartments. If it was under the same program, it might even be subsidized to some degree uh, to uh, worthy um, applicants. So the council is, the gloss is, oh, we're supporting, we're embracing uh, the work of art, and my, my heritage runs deep in the idea of art. But you're at the same time denying what you claim to be your desire. 15 seconds. For, housing, for affordable housing. But the public won't really understand that hmm. unless you admit that that's the exchange, that you're trading a zone, an RD3 Your time has elapsed. For someone's vision for the art community. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Come on up. You can come up. That project was already on the board and denied. I am in support of the city working with the grant applicants processing the Restore New York Communities Initiative. I am also grateful this project took a major step back from the initial multi-story complex taking cues from the building's past. That four-story, three-story, the half was already proposed and denied. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else? <laughs> Tell us who you are and where you live. Um, all I can say is the arts are one of the great things that have come to Beacon that is bringing Beacon back along with a lot of things that are here. And um, that, that, that building is zoned residential. Uh, okay, so what's the problem? So um, I, I think it's great for the city to support one man's dream. I think um, it, it, it's something that's really important, especially when it's something like this that will benefit the community. And I really support it. And um, who on some people who don't? Sorry. <laughs> Come on up, tell us who you are. Hello, I'm Kathleen Griffin. Um, I, I'm not a Beacon resident, but I'm in Beacon all the time, and I moved to the Hudson Valley because of the creative opportunities that, um, that are here. The first time I came to Beacon was for an art show in 2002. I had just graduated graduate school, um, and there were art shows on the main street. I think I'm part of a very large cohort of people who made their life in New York City as an artistic professional and came to the Hudson Valley for exactly opportunities like the one being proposed. Um, the suffragette Helen Todd once said, bread for all, but roses too. Um, I think it's sometimes impossible to quantify numerically, although we oftentimes try in the arts, what having the arts brings to people, particularly at-risk children. Um, as an adult, I've worked a lot with at-risk children, but as a teenager, it was exactly opportunities like the ones being created that took me out of one situation and opened the doors to something totally different. Um, I think that when we talk about the loss of housing for one group of pop people, it's important to talk about the loss of that other opportunity that might inspire and drive or bring somebody from one situation to another. So I am in support of the project, and that's just what I want to say. Thank you. Uh, anyone else in the physical public want to make a comment on this particular hearing? All right. Uh, ben, anyone online? We do have one hand raised online. That's Nicole. Call your have permission to speak whenever you're ready. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Michal. I live in Beacon. Um, I would like to ask the council to consider 
very carefully whether they would like to endorse um, a private citizen that hasn't made any specific uh, commitments to the disadvantaged youth, uh, receiving an additional $2 million from New York State. I understand that it is not from our city's budget, but there was a lack of information provided about how much money in total the project is and how much money was already provided by New York State grants. I believe my understanding is that $2 million were received from a different grant and $2 million are now being asked for and the council is being asked to endorse it. Why isn't the city of Beacon applying for the same $2 million for disadvantaged communities to go to our facility at 23 West Center Street to help to really help our disadvantaged youth as opposed to an empty promise to help without any specifics. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mayor, yeah. just a point of information that the New York Restore grant is not applicable to municipal buildings. Okay. And, and we do have to have a private partner. This is a program through Empire State Development. It's very geared towards um, assisting businesses to get over the renovation costs of blighted buildings. Um, and it's the first time anybody's ever come to us to say, would you do this? And it was well prepackaged. Um, this isn't being done at any detriment to other projects. This is on top of that. And if the state thinks it's a good program, the state will fund it. If the state doesn't think it's a good program, well, it's up to them to decide this. This is simply allowing this entity to um, apply. Um, anyone else online, Ben? No more speakers online. All right, can I get a motion to close the public motion hearing? Motion to close the public hearing. Second. So um, Molly and is it Pam? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Those are our public hearings. Thank you all very much. Um, uh, reports of council. You want to start at Molly's end and work our way over? Sure. Um, I will be having office hours on Friday, April 19th. That's two weeks from this coming Friday from 4 to 6 p.m. Uh, it will be in Pole Hill Park if the weather cooperates. If not, it will be at Bank Square. We have another public hearing, uh, another, sorry, another public meeting similar to this one the Monday before, so I'll update on the location then depending on uh, what the weather looks like it will be. But if you look for me in Pole Hill and I'm not there, look for me in the coffee shop right next door. Um, and then also, Chris, I don't know if it makes sense for this meeting, but uh, Lee mentioned the pro-housing letter of intent that was set, and I'm very curious to know. I see there are a couple options that we that you can apply under, so just kind of what the next steps are with that. Anything that would be helpful for us as the council or the public to know about that process. And with that, I'll pass it to Amber. Thank you. I'm also very interested in becoming a pro-housing community and understanding those options. So um, I have two things. I wanted to <laughs> remind people that uh, next Monday is a solar eclipse, and we are not in the path of totality, but we will have probably around 330, 326, I think, about 95% coverage. So I just be prepared for that. Uh, if you're driving or maybe don't be driving at that time or just kind of plan accordingly that it, it's going to be really cool. And if you want to look at it, make sure you're wearing glasses, but um, also use caution and uh, be in a safe spot to do that. Um, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was I wanted to acknowledge uh, Transgender Day of Visibility, which was yesterday. Uh, this is an annual event that has occurred every March 31st since 2009, and it is dedicated to celebrating transgender people and raising awareness of discrimination, um, as well as a celebration of their contributions to society. And um, I read a little bit about the uh, woman who founded this. Her name is Rachel Crandall Crocker. And uh, Rachel started this day to provide a focus on the living and to celebrate with her community. And uh, of the founding, Rachel, who has Tourette's, says, I have a disability, however I change the world. You don't have to be perfect. Come and change it along with me. And I just thought that was uh, such a lovely sentiment. And uh, such an uh, uh, an impactful action that this person had. So 
um, just encourage kind of to take that to heart and um, celebrate and maybe learn a little bit more about uh, some of the amazing transgender people who have done great things in our world. So that's it from me. Thank you. Um, I will just second everything that Amber and Molly said and say that um, my office hours, uh, next office hours are Sunday, April 13th um, from 4 to 6 p.m. also at Bank Square. Good evening. Um, just making my uh, microphone come closer to me. <laughs> I don't have much to uh, report, but I did want to kind. I wanted to thank all our first responders. I know we had a fire um, in Colonial Springs apartments that um, you know our fire firefighters worked hard for. And one thing with that is, if you see a fire, call nine one one. Do not call the firehouse general number. Right. Um, this was actually reported by Newberg, so. It really is important for you to call 911 if you see a fire. Um, also, thank our ambulance uh, that had gone over to Stewart to, um, you know, an issue with the airplane of turbulence and um, that they were at least available. I know Orange County had covered it, but that's still a stressful situation that they had to be part of this past weekend. Um, so, thank you. And um, I also just wanted to, you know, fellow council member Amber Grant, uh, we played pickleball with so a, that, our, <laughs> that our city of Beacon Rec had, uh, had had available since the end of February on Saturday mornings from 9 to 11 at the Salvation Army. We have one more Saturday from 9 to 11. I hope to be there. And it's for um, anyone 12 and up. Uh, they just asked for a five dollar donation. I have learned a lot, and we've had some great groups uh, coming out. I, I, I've already played gone three times, so one last one, and then we'll be able to hit the outdoor pickleball courts. So if you are a pickleball player and want to find some partners, you can reach out to me, and maybe <laughs> maybe I'll be available. Um, I do not have office hours. I'm still struggling with the office hours, but if you want to speak with me. Send me an email. I'll put my, um, you know, a phone number down to just reach out to me, and um, you know, I'll, I'll more than willing try to work around a schedule. And as I look at JC, I just also wanted to thank since uh, our last meeting, I attended the first uh, Fishkill Avenue rezoning committee meeting that they had, and I'm, you know, I live in that area, so you know, I, I. I it means a lot to me. It's adjacent to my property, but I am so excited of what this committee is going to do. I, I I just was really invigorated by our city planner and the leadership of JC and the members of that committee. So thank you. I I will pickleball was super fun, and I will be there again on Saturday with you, Pam. So uh, yeah, maybe that can be office hours. They even have paddles if you don't have one. All right. Um, in addition to learning more about the pro housing community, I'd like to echo um, a request that I think came up in the last couple meetings, which is to dust off our list of potential affordable housing solutions and to uh, look through those again, perhaps through the uh, clear eyes of our uh, new planner. Um, but it would be great to start looking at um, making some progress on some of those other options available to us in addition to having the discussion about parking. And then I'll just say that um, I have office hours always on the third Sunday of every month. So this month, that means it's the 21st, and it's at Trax Coffee House at 1 East Main from 10 to 12 o'clock. Thanks. Okay. Um, I spoke enough. Um, I have a couple updates. Uh, the pro housing application is being uploaded tonight by our city planner, Natalie Quinn. Um, I believe we complied with the the terms of it, but if not, we would come back and do a resolution. So I know that she was working with the deputy chief of staff today on uploading that material. So we have advanced that. Um, just a couple other initiatives we've done recently I wanted to give an update on. Um, our welcome center has been pretty much dormant since uh, COVID, and the Beacon Chamber of Commerce had tried last year to resurrect it without 
much success. So we are um, creating a partnership with Dutchess County Tourism, which is going to coordinate, and we are doing a training for volunteers on Saturday, April 27th at noon. Um, we'll be meeting over, over here and then doing a tour of the facility. We have a good core group of volunteers who are willing to staff that and try to resurrect the program. Um, and we would invite anyone else to join us. We'll have more details up on our website tomorrow. Um, we have a community solar opportunity that remains open where um, residents can sign up to buy part of a, the output of a um, solar farm in the Hudson Valley and receive 10% off their electricity bill. So far, we've had almost 100 households sign up. So it's been very successful. The more households that do this, we also earn um, points in our climate smart, in our clean energy program, um, which helps us with grants. And then I just wanted to say we just closed a pilot program for the trees that the mayor discussed where um, we basically are delivering trees to people's doors for about half the price. Um, there's no, no um, city funds involved, it's just our sweat equity in delivering these and having arranged wholesale prices uh, with a vendor locally. We view it as having been really successful the first year. We look to expand it next year and figure out um, some different offerings we could do. We definitely know dogwoods and redbuds are more popular than the huge tree. So we're, we'll recalibrate for next year. I'm sorry if you um, only just found out about the program and it's closing, but we did need to have a cutoff. And um, that's all I have. Thank you. OK, um, I do have one item uh, before we start on a couple of resolutions, uh, which is a proclamation. So uh, this is in honor of Autism Awareness, because April is Autism Awareness Month. So whereas autism is a pervasive development disorder affecting the social learning and behavioral skills of those affected by it, and whereas autism was once thought to be a relatively rare disorder, but with increased awareness and diagnosis, is estimated to occur as frequently as one in 60 children. And whereas there is no cure for autism, it is well documented that if individuals with autism receive treatment early in their lives, it is often possible for them to make significant improvement. And whereas the Autism Society of America has spearheaded an awareness effort in order to educate parents, professionals, and the general public about autism and its effects, now, th now therefore be it resolved that I, Mayor Lee Kiriakou, do hereby proclaim April as Autism Awareness Month in the City of Beacon, um, dated today. So thank you. Okay, um, we've got two resolutions. Let's start up on them. One is um, declaring the City Council's intent to be lead agency. We would be lead agency for the seeker uh, review regarding the Mount Beacon water tank replacement project. Let me get a motion and a second. Motion. Second. So, um, that was Amber and Dan. And then Nick, will you give us a background for the public? Thank you, Mayor. And this was discussed at last week's uh, workshop meeting of the City Council. The city owns and operates a 1 million gallon water tank at the top of Pocket Road on property located in the city of Beacon, as well as in the town of Fishkill. The water tank is about 70 years old and needs to be uh, replaced. So this is the first step in that of a public process in which the city declares its intent to be the lead agency so that under the State Environmental Quality Review Act, it's the city that says we are going to look at the potential environmental impacts and identify those and analyze them. The other involved or interested agencies are the Town of Fishkill, the Dutchess County Department of Health, and the New York State Office of Parks and Recreation. So this is merely giving the parties the um, notice of the city's intent. And then once the 30 day passes and assuming no one objects, this will then come back to the city council to make that uh, secret determination of significance. Okay, any discussion by the council? Um, Nick, it looks like there are some easements that will be involved in this project. Will that come later once the lead agency question is resolved? That is correct. And the New York State Parks Department, which is the one that would be providing the easement to the city for some grading, and I think a retaining wall adjacent to the water tower, um, they cannot take any action on that until the secret determination of significance has been made. So after the secret determination of significance is made, we then come back to you for authorization to enter into an easement agreement with the state. 
And then Chris, I know at least previously there's been some discussion of if once this project is complete and where it would end up that there might be the potential for parking at that trailhead. Can you say at this point whether or not that is still an option? We did a lot of title research on Pocket Road that was necessary for this and it turns out that um, we have an easement over Pocket Road. We actually don't own Pocket Road. And we do need some um, an easement from one of the adjacent owners who's one of the owners of the road also. Um, and so I don't, I don't think we're going to be able to do it. It's really a private, we'll look, look into the easement further, but um, we don't own as much as we thought originally up there. Um, so we have an access easement across two parcels, and one of the parcel holders is key to us being able to rebuild the tank and they do not want parking up there. They said this, this easement really is for your water services. Um, now we'll, we'll continue to work on it, but um, I think that might be why this got marked as a private access, because mm -hmm. it technically is a private access. Oh, great, thank you for that update. Interesting. Yeah, and we, we just only learned that about four weeks ago. Okay. Any other thoughts or comments on this particular resolution? Okay, so um, this is to declare the City Council uh, lead agency for seeker purposes regarding the water tank replacement project. All in favor of that say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, one down. So the second one is this, a, a resolution supporting an application for round eight of Restore New York uh, initiatives uh, for the Garage Works studio project at 35 Henry Street. Can I get a motion and a second and Nick will talk us through it. Motion. Second. So that's Amber and Dan. And Nick, you've already introduced it because of the hearing, but is there more that you would add? And what is it that we are doing, and how does it help this grant? Sure, Mayor. So nothing further to add, but the resolution goes through the criteria that the state requests the city find in advancing this application for the state to then make its consideration as to whether the state should award any funds. So um, the whereas it states that um, it aligns with the city's vision for the transitional zone for re revitalization and repurposing of the of the vacant space, the former uh, garage shop, so as to attract, create, and sustain art, culture, and employment opportunities in the community, which the applicant um, spoke about during his presentation, that the funding is appropriate for this specific rehabilitation project and facilitates the effective and efficient use of existing and future public resources so as to promote economic development and the preservation of community resources. And then just states that we've, um, the city held the public hearing and that the city supports the application. And Chris um, or Nick, I just wanna reconfirm, I think a couple of things from our original conversation. Um, the applicant had stated that they were uh, that there would be no fees for the city, either some kind of reimbursement would be worked out. So the city is not paying for any of the application fees, correct? Correct. They, they're going to reimburse us for um, the cost of notification in the paper, for Nick, for our attorney's time, and also for the 10% that uh, is the match, the local match. Great. And then um, the so other. So this was cost, this will be cost neutral to us. Okay. Thank you for that. And then the other thing I wanted to confirm is that um, the city can consider multiple applicants, but only advance one forward. Did we hear from anybody else who's interested in applying for this grant this round? No. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments, questions by the council? Okay, I'll just add that uh, one of my first focuses when I became a council member in Ward 2 in 1994 was on this building and about, you know, its impacts on the immediate neighbors. So um, it's been a long time coming to see a change. Um, mm -hmm. so, all in favor of... Uh, Sorry, before we do that, I'll also say that I appreciate there have been some comments about whether or not this fits the full criteria, and as sort of Amber, I think Nick said, that that's up to the state to decide what they want to do, but I appreciate that this is something, whether or not we end up being successful this time, that this kind of project could be, or this kind of funding is something that there seems to be value in us seeing, you know, whether or not this fits, as, and as Amber clarified, it's the only project that comes 
forward. So there might be future projects if there is more than one where we might take more consideration of what kind of what best fits within the future vision of our city. But I do like the supports, the arts and that and also the environmental impact that the design of this building seems to be taking into account as well. Yeah, and you know, as we you know, further our progress in the community, we become eligible for some things and lose eligibility for others. You know, I, I you know, remember hearing very, you know, directly but privately from Empire State Development, the quote was, we were a victim of our own success in terms of the DRI grant, the Downtown Revitalization Initiative. And it's like, well, what, wait, wait, I, we've got great ideas. And they said, no doubt that you do, but there are other communities that have greater needs in their downtowns. And so I, I think the ability to find new sources and new ways to leverage grant money, which has always been a way that we've been really successful is you know investing additional funds, not our own, into the community. We may come up with some new ways to do it, and this may be one of them. So. Mm -hmm. All right, everyone ready? Okay, so all in favor of uh, supporting an application uh, by Garage Works for Restore New York Communities Initiative, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, so that passes. Um, so I'm looking for a motion and a second to approve the minutes of March 18th. Motion. Second. Um, so that was Molly and Dan. Uh, and given that it's uh, April 1st, uh, were there any changes, additions, or Easter eggs you discovered in that? I was disappointed that there were not. I was hoping for we a little something. We were awfully tempted, Molly. <laughs> but I, just, you know. I thought you might. I, th I thought maybe that was why there was a slight delay, and then but, we added. But you should have seen the agenda Nick put together for tonight <laughs> that I had. A, so we have a motion and a second to move them up to approve the minutes of March 18th. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? All right, I got to announce the next meeting is next Monday. That will be the second Monday of the month. That will be a workshop meeting. I would like to note to the council, this is a five Monday month. And so ordinarily the fourth Monday, uh, the 22nd, would be our Monday off and that we would have a workshop on the 29th uh, prior to the first formal meeting of the month in May. I just want to note that I will be remote in California on the 29th because Greek Easter is uh, May 5th, the following Sunday. And I'm also hearing that our deputy mayor may be in hiding as a result. Well, not as a result, <laughs> but uh, may also not be available. Would the council consider possibly using the 22nd, that fourth week, instead of our fifth as a workshop week? I'll just ask you to consider it. Nick, we don't have to do anything sooner than our workshop, do we? No, correct. You have sufficient time to renote that. Right. So I'll just ask you take a look at your calendars, and you know if it's possibly. I think we get a better um, attendance if we use that fourth uh, uh, Monday instead of the fifth. Okay. All right. So just take a look, um, and that's all I got on that. Um, so uh, this brings us to our second opportunity for public comments. For those of you who didn't take advantage of the first, anyone in the physical audience um, like to speak? And then, Ben, anyone in the remote audience would like to speak who did not speak previously? No hands raised on Zoom. I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. Motion. Second. Uh, Amber and Dan, are you, you going to make a record of this? Yeah, you guys Am I the new John Rambert? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you very much. Everybody. Thank you, Nick. Thank you.